You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Psalm 34, 19, it says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. What I want you to see is many. It doesn't say the righteous have some trials or the righteous have no trials. Oh, that's great, man, no trials. No, no, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous. That means we all go through it, all of us, because God uses trials to strengthen us, to build up our faith. But the Lord, He delivers us, He's with us, He sustains us. Have you ever met someone who thinks, I'm a Christian now, that means I won't struggle, right? In today's message, Pastor Ron shows you how that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, Christians are called to suffer for the Lord. You may be thinking, then what's the point of following Christ if all I'm going to do is suffer and struggle? As you'll see, the difference in being a follower of Christ is that God will sustain you through the struggles, and that will be what helps others see God through you. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 21 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. I love to read stories about prayer. Ian Bounds is a great one. George Mueller, wow, what a powerful biographer. He documents 50,000 prayers that he requested, and he records the answer to them. So I wanna read to you, it's a little lengthy, but I wanna read just one of them from his book. Shrouded in thick fog off the coast of Newfoundland, a steamer edged slowly forward, its foghorn sounding out the mournful notes of warning. The captain, red-eyed from a lack of sleep and from peering faintly in the doom, he was startled by a gentle chap on his shoulder. He swung around to find one of his passengers, an old man in his late 70s, tall, dignified in appearance, with impressive mutton-chop whiskers and penetrating eyes. Captain, he said, I have to tell you, I must be in Quebec on Saturday afternoon. It was now Wednesday. The captain thought he heard a slightly foreign accent in the voice, and he replies, impossible. And he actually resented the intrusion of a passenger coming in the sanctity of his bridge. Very well, was the calm response. If your ship can't take me, God will find some other means to take me, because I've never broken an engagement in 57 years. The man's tranquility calmed the ruffled and tired captain, and he lifted his weird hands in a gesture of despair. Well, I'd like to help, but I can't. Then the old man suggested, listen, captain, let's go down into the chart room and pray. The captain looked at him as though he had just escaped from a lunatic asylum to make such a ridiculous suggestion. First of all, he said, do you know how dense the fog is out there? There's no way. Without demurring, the passenger responded, no. My eye is not on the thickness of the fog. My eye is on the living God who controls every circumstance of life. The captain found himself uncontrolling, following the old man to the chart room, and he knelt with him in prayer. With childlike simplicity then, the man lifted his voice to God in a prayer that the captain thought to himself was more suited for a Sunday school class than their fog-bound predicament. Here was the prayer. Oh Lord, if it is constant with your will, please remove this fog in five minutes. You know the engagement that I made for you in Quebec on Saturday, and I believe it's your will, amen. The captain, who was a nominal Christian, had thought to better humor the old man, and he was just about to pray, but then he felt a tap on his shoulder. He opened, and his eyes blinked a little bit, and he heard the resentment, don't pray, captain, because you do not believe. And as I already believe God has answered, there's no need for you to pray, captain. <laughs> The captain gulped, you know, and began to wonder, who's in charge of this ship? But there was an air of authority in this man, and it compelled respect. He went on, Captain, I've known my Lord for 57 years, and there has never been a single day that I've failed to gain an audience with the king. So get up, Captain, open the door, and you're gonna find the fog is gone. The captain duly obeyed. He flung open the door, and amazed and astounded, the fog had disappeared. The captain testified that his encounter with the aged and revered George Mueller completely revolutionized his Christian life, end quote. Now, that's just one of many stories, but I love to read those stories of how God works in prayer. And you know, I've seen God do amazing things. But one thing we learn about a seasoned warrior is they never cease to pray. They are people of prayer. They love to pray. And I love to be a people around that love to do that. So listen, this is what makes a nominal Christian, a seasoned warrior. Be a person of prayer. Take that time daily to have and develop a prayer time with God. You say, well, man, do I have to pray a half an hour, an hour? Just why don't you start off with what you can? Start off taking those steps. Listen, people that run a marathon don't run 26 miles the first day. 
Just start doing it. Start praying with the Lord. Think about the Lord throughout the day. Take advantage of times when we gather corporately to pray. So a seasoned warrior seeks to be focused, has fellowship, really seeks it out, sees it as important, and then prays. Now there's a fourth thing mentioned here, and I wrote down, seeks peace with all men. Interesting development in verses six through nine. Now when we had taken our leave of one another, so now he leaves Tyre, we boarded the ship and we returned home, and we finished our voyage from Tyre, and now we came to Ptolemus, greeted the brethren, stayed with them one day. So now he ports in one place is there just one day, but again, he seeks out believers. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5.15, redeem your time. And we need to do that all the time. Redeem the time you have. Don't waste it. So Paul used the best of all of his time. He's there today. He fellowships with believers. But then on the next day, we were with Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea. And they entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this is quite an interesting story and development. And you might not see it at first, but uh, first of all, it tells us he was one of the seven. What does that mean? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter six, do you remember the church had just been birthed in chapter two? It was growing so big, there were so many needs that the apostles needed to appoint godly men to help them assist in ministry. And there we have the first seven deacons of the church chosen. And one of them was Philip. And why was Philip chosen? Why were any of the seven chosen? It tells us in Acts 6, 3 seeking out seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So these were godly men. And God was using them just to do physical things in the church. But because they were godly men and they were faithful in the little things, God gave several of these men more to do. One of them was Philip. God anointed him with the gift of evangelism. Verse eight, in fact, tells us he was an evangelist. But it's interesting, moving on from Acts chapter six, we come to Acts chapter eight, and you may or may not remember it, but it was Philip who took the gospel first to Samaria, right next to Jerusalem. Before Paul had ever gone out and taken it to the Gentiles, Philip had started that. He took it to a group of people. Samaritans were half Jewish, half Gentiles. They were a mixed breed, and because of that, Jews wanted nothing to do with them. But you remember, Jesus had already gone earlier, setting the precedence. He had gone to the woman at the well in Samaria, led her to Christ, and she went out and shared that with all the surrounding cities, so it was ripe, and now the gospel has gone out, and Philip comes there, he shares the gospel, and if you read chapter eight, it tells us there was a revival there. Amazing. Great gift of evangelism, and then after that, God called Philip to leave this great revival and go to the area of Gaza, a desert. But he was there, and there was a man who was at, he's called an Ethiopian eunuch, but he worked for the queen of Ethiopia, And he led that man to Christ, and that man went back with the gospel. And by the way, Christianity has always been known deep in the heart of Ethiopia, still to this day, all because of that encounter. So God used Philip in a very powerful way. Now, the last we hear of Philip is in Acts chapter 8 in verse 40. And it tells us that he settled in Caesarea. So Paul, on his way to Jerusalem, stops in Caesarea, and he goes to the home of Philip. Now, there's a reason why, and you might not catch it because this is an unusual reunion. There is a common denominator. There's a gentleman that's a common denominator in the life of both of these men. His name is Stephen. Stephen was the other deacon that was used mightily by God in the area of evangelism. Remember, Stephen, it says they could not even withstand his wisdom so that they stoned Stephen to death. He was the church's first martyr. That's Philip's friend. And who was the ringleader? Where did they put the coat so when he was being killed? It was Paul. It was Paul. Paul was consenting to it. It was Paul who was the great persecutor of the church. And now all these years have passed by, and now Paul is gonna visit Philip. And I think he's doing that for a reason. He's seeking to make peace with him. He's seeking to share with him, man, I am so sorry for what I did. For since that time, Christ has saved me. I've been using my life now focused just to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe Paul came here to make amends, to ask for forgiveness. He was a changed man. And Paul himself wrote in Romans 12 and verse 18, if it is possible, as much depends on you, live at peace with all men. And that's what he's doing. He's now been walking with the Lord for years. And he's saying, why should there be any animosity between me and everybody? I'm a Christian. God has saved me. 
I remember many times in my life calling up people that I needed to make things right after I got saved. And there are still those events that happen in our life when we walk with the Lord. There are times of falling out, and as much as depends on us, we need to do what we can to make it right with them. And the only way to do that is to walk in humility. That's it. Paul, in a spirit of humility, seeking to have peace, goes to Philip. And again, we aren't told the specifics, but we do know the background, and I believe it was a beautiful, beautiful reunion. Now, we're also told here in verse nine that this man, that's Philip, had four virgin daughters. That's a simply a biblical term of saying that they were not married. These were unmarried daughters, still living with them, who prophesied. Now, we don't know all the details, but we do know that this would fulfill what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. When Peter, on the day that he preached the sermon, the church was birthed, he quoted the book of Joel. In Acts 2, 17, it said, come to pass. In the last day, he says, God, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now, one of the things about that term prophecy or prophesy, we automatically think of predictive prophecy, right? Someone's prophesying, so they're saying something about the future, you know. But that's not the predominant use of this gift. One is, yes, prophecy. It could be a predictive prophecy. But more often than not, prophecy was used to speak the already written word of God. So if you look at most of the prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, many others, they were taking the already written word of God and they were calling the nation to live up to what it already says. It wasn't all predictive prophecy, though God would use that. So when we see these four ladies, you know, they're told that they prophesied, most likely they were just, you know, doing Bible study. We don't know. I can't be certain. We can't be certain. We know that they're not teaching men because there were no, there were no women pastors in the Bible, and neither should there be today. That's unbiblical, by the way. But here they are prophesying. We'd have no other further details, but... He had these four daughters that are involved in ministry. So this is a godly family that loved Jesus. And here's Paul, but his main point here is he wants to make it right with his brother. And that's what we do as we mature in the Lord, seek to make things right. And then finally, one last thing, a seasoned warrior seeks God's will no matter what. No matter what. Notice this verse 10, and we stayed many days. So they were there for a while, just having fellowship. And while they're there, a certain prophet, now here's another prophet, named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, we met Agabus earlier in chapter 11. He actually prophesied. Now, this was a predictive prophecy. He actually said, there is coming a famine to Palestine, to actually the area of Jerusalem. And he was actually proven to be right. In fact, that's why Paul has been collecting funds to take to Jerusalem, because they've been hard hit. So what this man shared was 100% accurate. So if someone says they are a prophet, in other words, they speak predictive prophecy, and there are people that are so bold as to say that, how do you know if someone is truly a prophet? How do you know that? Deuteronomy chapter 18, you can read it on your own. It tells us. It means that everything they say comes to pass 100%. And if it doesn't, they should be stoned. So I don't know about you, but before I would ever stand up before an audience of people and say, thus says the Lord, I would definitely make sure the Lord has thus said it. So, and I say that because most of these people, they make these predictive prophecies all the time in the name of Jesus, and many of the things they say don't come to pass. And you ask people, that person's not a prophet. Well, you know, one out of 10. One out of 10? That's not the Lord. If it's the Lord, it's 100% all the time. So here we have a man, though, who was proven to be a true prophet. What he had said had come to pass. And by the way, what he says here would come to pass as well. So what does he say? Well, he comes up to Paul, verse 11. He comes up to us and took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, first of all, talk about a colorful character. This guy would make your party very colorful, wouldn't he? I mean, this guy just comes out, takes Paul's belt. How you doing, Paul? Whoosh, takes off his belt and binds himself up. I mean, this, you think this guy's a little crazy. But let me say this. He's doing something that many times we see in the Old Testament prophets doing. For example, the prophet Ezekiel was told by God to lie on his side on one side for over a year. And then on another side, God would have them actually live out many of the things that they were doing. Let me give you another illustration. 1 Kings eleven twenty nine, 29. Jeroboam 
was going out from Jerusalem, and the prophet Ahijah met him on the way. Now Ahijah had clothed himself in a brand new garment, and the two were there in the field. And Ahijah now takes off his brand new garment that was on him, and he tore it in 12 pieces, right in front of him. And he said to Jeroboam, take these 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, I'm tearing the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. He will only have two. You see, at the end of Solomon, that's King David's son, Solomon had gone after many wives, and they had turned his heart from God, and God said to Solomon, you're only gonna keep two tribes. The kingdom would be divided. And I'll do that to fulfill my word to David that you know, his sons will succeed and the Messiah will come through your seed. But the 10 of the tribes are going to Jeroboam. It was a graphic illustration to demonstrate that. And that's exactly what Agabus is doing here. He's warning Paul. Listen, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna be bound there. You're gonna be imprisoned. Now that said, we come to verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So don't go, Paul. You're gonna be bound, you know. Well, first of all, let me say this. Agabus did not forbid Paul to go. He was simply telling what's gonna happen to Paul. You see, back in chapter 20, Paul already knew that God wanted him to go to Jerusalem. He had already said, none of these things move me. God, I'm bound to do that. I know that persecution awaits me. I'm still gonna do it. In fact, if you want to, look ahead at chapter 23, just a couple chapters ahead. And even Jesus confirms this. In Acts 23, first of all, in verse one, it says, Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brother, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So he's now before a council and he's saying, first of all, I have a good conscience. Everything I've done up to this point, I know God's wanted me to do, which would include the persecution that awaits him. But he has the ultimate confirmation down in verse 11. The following night, the Lord, Jesus, stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, in other words, this was part of my plan, I wanted you to be bound in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. That would lead him to Rome. So Paul knew that this was God's calling for his life, and Jesus even confirms it. Unfortunately, back here in verse 21, everybody's a little shaken by the idea. They love Paul. They don't want him to see him go through it. They're pleading not to go. But Paul was compelled by the Holy Spirit, and he knew that this is what God wanted him to do. First of all, to bring this love gift to the church in Jerusalem. In doing so, that would really unite the pressing division between Jewish and and Gentile believers. He really knew that God wanted to do this. It would also open up opportunity for him to share the gospel even more. So others might try to divert him. He knew this was God's plan. So he says in verse 13, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Why are you guys trying to stop me? This is part of God's plan. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of Lord Jesus. Even if God wanted to take my, my life, as I already said earlier, <laughs> what's the worst gonna happen? I'll be with the Lord, you know. Again, Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me. So Paul saw himself as expendable. And the point I want you to see is this. A seasoned warrior seeks to do the will of God no matter the cost. Paul was not going to retreat. He was a man of courage, a man of conviction. And there is something about a person of conviction and courage that endears us, right? I mean, we just... I mean, there's something about someone that says, listen, I'm called to do this and I will not be thwarted, especially when it's talking about spiritual things. And Paul's life then stands as an example for us that when God calls you to do something, see it to completion. When God calls you to be faithful, then be faithful to him. Don't worry about the consequences. God is faithful. Listen, what God begins, he'll complete. You don't have to worry. So Paul's been in prison before. He's spent his many times in the eye of the storm. God sustained him. God will sustain him again. And many of you are in the eye of the storm right now. You're going through some kind of trial. It might be something in your marriage. It might be a financial trial. It might be physically something you're dealing with, and it's so hard, it's so difficult. Or maybe it's someone in your family, a family member. God is gonna sustain you. God is gonna be with you. You know, there's so many needs. We go through trials but God never fails to be with us. God is good, he is faithful. In fact, let me give you a verse that is so powerful when you think about it. Psalm 34, 19, it says this, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. What I want you to see is many. It doesn't say the righteous have some trials 
or the righteous have no trials. Oh, that's great, man, no trials. No, no, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous. That means we all go through it, all of us, because God uses trials to strengthen us, to build up our faith. But the Lord, he delivers us, he's with us, he sustains us. So Paul, his own companions try to detract him, but he's gonna stay on track. So verse 14, when he could not be persuaded, we see saying, hey, the will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord. Now think about this, Paul could not be persuaded. You wanna know why Paul couldn't be persuaded? Because he was already persuaded. What do you mean he was already persuaded? Romans 8, 38. He writes this, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And what is true of Paul is true of you. You can be persuaded to know that is true. God is gonna be with you in the fire. He'll be with you in the storm. He'll be with you through all things. He is good. No wonder why beatings, imprisonments, threatenings didn't deter fall. Nothing. He was resolute. He knows God has a plan for him, and he's sticking to it. Listen, later on, he will be in prison. Not only in Jerusalem, he's gonna be taken to Rome. He's gonna stand before Caesar. He's gonna be in prison in the palace. Did you know he wrote many of his letters from Rome in prison? But one of the most significant one is what he writes at the end of the book of Philippians. As he does in all of his letters, he's closing off, but this is what he writes at the end of his letter in Philippians 4.22. All the saints send you their greetings, especially those from Caesar's household. Paul being imprisoned in Rome and in the palace had opportunities to talk to those that were in the know in Peter in uh, Caesar's own household, and he led them to Christ. And so would it have been worth it? Absolutely, absolutely. Now verse 15, after those days we packed up and we went to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them one Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple, a young one, whom we were to lodge. So they took with them this guy, Mason. They're not far from Jerusalem. And when they get Jerusalem, they'll stay at his house. They'll have a place to stay when they're there. So here is Paul now winding up his third missionary journey. And again, he shows us what a seasoned warrior looks like. I don't know about you, but these are things that I wanna pray about. I wanna have in my life. I wanna be focused for Jesus. In Philippians 3.13, Paul said this, brethren, I haven't apprehended. I haven't arrived He's writing at the end of the line, I haven't arrived, but one thing I do, I forget those things which were behind, and I press towards those things which are ahead. That's focus. Let's do the same thing. We can't change the past, but we can be focused for what Jesus calls us in the future, right? The second thing is we can continue in fellowship like Paul did. One of the biggest deceptions is say, I don't need to be in fellowship. You know, I had two things happen to me. I was walking out, and a lady was walking out. She had a cane. She was walking very slowly. So I said, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? She says, no, you very encouraged me. I'm back here. I was out of fellowship for years. You shared that you had cancer, and I thought to myself, if you could be up there teaching God's word, I need to be in church. I said, praise the Lord. And then I had my chemo, and there's a lady coming out of her treatment. She goes, Pastor Ron, it's so good to see you. And I, you know, we exchanged what we're dealing with, and she goes, you know what? I've been out of church. But now that I see you here and you're dealing with cancer, I'm gonna be at church. Yeah, so I'm just telling you how important fellowship is for us. If we can find the time, there's always somebody that has it worse than us. There's always excuses. What's your excuse? What is it? We've all got excuses. Be faithful in fellowship. Seek to be a person of prayer. Find that time. Carve out that time. Say, I'm gonna be a person that communes with God. Be mature by being humble. Seek out to be at peace with those that have you know maybe rubbed you the wrong way. Seek as best you can to have godly relationships. And finally, no matter what, do what God's called you to do. Paul would not be deterred. He didn't count his life dear to himself. He says, Lord, whatever you wanna do, I'm gonna do it. Let's be those people. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint, who's making his way through the book of Acts. In this book, you'll find everything you ever wanted to know about being a disciple in a world after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Of course, we've only known that world, but the original 12 found themselves alone to continue spreading the good news and creating more disciples. Of course, they had prayer as you and I do, 
but that must have been of little comfort after having spent time in partnership with the only Son of God. We all have examples of being next to someone we admired and then following in their footsteps or simply aspiring to be more like them in our lives. Are you living a life more like Christ each and every day? Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. Are you in the Houston area? We'd love to see you here next time if you get the chance. We meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 in the morning and on Wednesday evenings at 7. You can find our locations and answers to all of our questions at ltlradio.org. Once again, that's ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app as well. The Larger Than Life podcast is available to stream from the podcast link, or you can subscribe from your favorite app so you never miss an episode. We hope you'll join us next time for another message on Larger Than Life.